This is Duke University. As you all know, we're in for a treat today as we welcome to Duke the well-known, controversial, thought-provoking Richard Dawkins. This is a special lecture, not affiliated with any of our numerous formal lecture series. It is, however, connected to the first provost lecture series, which began six years ago, which was actually dedicated to the theme of evolution and religion. We have Duke alum Todd Stifel to thank for inviting Dr. Dawkins to Duke. In addition to Todd, I would like to recognize and thank the co-sponsors of today's lecture. lecture. Chancellor Zhao of the, of the Medical Center, Trinity College of Arts and Sciences, the Duke Institute for Genome Sciences and Policy, the Center for Philosophy of Biology, and the Departments of Biology, Evolutionary Anthropology, and Philosophy. Now a little word about Todd Stifel, who brought Dr. Dawkins here. Todd Stifel held positions in marketing, sales operations, and strategy with Stifel Laboratories for 12 years. After leaving that position, he became the president of the Stifel Free Thought Foundation. His bio states he is a secular humanist, an atheist, and a full-time free thought activist who envisions a world where government favors liberty over dogma and free thinkers are overt, united, and influential. Todd is a trustee of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, and as I've said, we are grateful to him for suggesting to Dr. Dawkins that he make a Duke stop on his tour. Now let me introduce to you Todd Stifel. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming out today. As I said, I am here to do some introductions, and I am honored and grateful to be able to do so. So let's talk briefly about RDF. RDF is the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. So what is RDF's connection to Duke University? There's actually two connections. One is that two of the three trustees of RDF are actually Duke alums and encouraged Richard to come out here and thought what better place for Richard to spread the message of science and to educate people on evolution than right here at Duke University. Additional reason is this is the home of where I would say I found reason. I took a class in Old Testament history here with Professor Wintermute once upon a time and learned about things such as the angels were originally pagan deities that were co-opted into the Bible. And I wouldn't say that caused me to lose my faith, but it certainly did cause me to find reason. So it is interesting to be back here at Duke today speaking for the Richard Dawkins Foundation. So what does RDF do? First of all, our mission essentially is to, pour, to support reason and science. And the two primary ways we do this is through education, where we focus on science, religion, and secular values, as well as the promotion of an evidence-based understanding of the natural world. We believe that we should see the world through the lens of evidence and through the evidence through the lens of reality. Additionally, we combat primarily two things. We are opposed to religious-based discrimination in any of its forms, whether it be against women, whether it be against atheists, or whether it be against the gay community. We believe this opposition is critical to helping overcome human suffering in the world. Additionally, we're also opposed to religious fundamentalism. We are not per se opposed to religion, but religion fundamentalism itself is one of the greatest dangers in the world today and something we all need to rally behind opposing and making sure we overcome it to ensure a safe future. So here are a few of the critical projects of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. First of all, RDF TV. Is anybody familiar with RDF TV out there? I can't hear hands, folks. Anybody familiar with it? Excellent. RDF TV is a channel that we have on YouTube where you can go and see what we refer to as vignettes, which are little clips from people that are experts in their subject, whether it be on religion, ethics, atheism, 
or many of them are on science with a particular focus on evolution, and Richard Starr is in a great number of those, and some of you may have seen him in the Galapagos uh, comparing different species. Additionally, we do DVDs, which we utilize to promote education, such as the Four Horsemen DVD. Lectures, we have a host of lecturers on our panel, and Richard himself is obviously one of those. And he, for example, Richard goes around the world and either donates his lectures or takes the honorariums and donates them straight to the foundation. He does not make money touring and helping educate the world. Two other important projects that are near and dear to me. First of all, Nonbelievers Giving Aid. This is our charity organization that focuses on disaster relief. We just started it this year, and we are very proud and excited about it. The first initiative we did was to support the earthquake in Haiti. Well, not to support the earthquake, to support the recovery from the earthquake. <laughs> we don't have that kind of power. <laughs> And we raised over a half a million dollars in just a couple of weeks, which is enormous for our movement and something that we are trying to do more and more of out there to help level the playing field for who is considered ethical out there and to demonstrate that free thinkers are ethical, charitable people as well. Another of our campaigns is the Out Campaign. The symbol of it is right here, the Scarlet A, which does not stand for adulterer, I swear, sweetheart. <laughs> My wife's in the front row. Honest. The A is part of our out campaign, which is actually from the playbook of the LGBT community and is an extremely successful campaign. We are encouraging free thinkers to come out and live out. The best way to end the discrimination and the stigma is for people to recognize that we're your friends, your family and your neighbors, your coworkers. We're out there, we're good people too, and we believe through the Out Campaign we can really make a difference. So I'm gonna encourage you folks to do a few things. You thought this was free. <laughs> First of all, learn more. Education, folks, learn more. You can go to richarddawkins.net. We have an enormous amount of information there that I think you'll find very useful and study science and religion. These are critical topics we should all understand. Join local and national groups. Get involved, get active. There are many out there. There are many in the triangle as well. Live out, be out, be part of that out campaign. Write and rally. Write letters to your newspapers. Rally, get involved, stand up for what you believe in. And of course, donate. We are outgunned, unfortunately. We have vastly smaller resources than people who are opposed to science. And we need to get out there, and we need people to get involved. So I'm going to encourage all of you to become activists, to get involved, get engaged, and stand up for what you believe in. <laughs> Moving on. Who is Richard Dawkins? This may be obvious because I'm guessing if you are here, you know the answer to this question, but I'm gonna answer it anyway because that's why I'm here. First of all, Professor Richard Dawkins is a philanthropist and a leader. He is a major donor in the free thought and science communities and is one of the leaders of both movements. He is the retired Oxford professor of public understanding of science. He is also the famed proponent of the gene-centered view of evolution and natural selection. He is one of the world's most renowned evolutionary biologists. He even coined the term meme, which many of you may be familiar with. And he is a best-selling author of many books. He has 10 books out. Some of the most famous are The Selfish Gene, The God Delusion, and The Greatest Show on Earth. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Richard Dawkins. Let's try again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I don't do that strident stuff that uh, Todd was just doing. I'm, I'm the good cop after that. Um, 
going to show a proper British reticence. <laughs> Talking of money, uh, Todd mentioned that the people who are opposed to us have pots of money. Did any of you get handed a free book as you, as you walked in? Where do you think the money comes from to print those books and hand them out free? Because I'd like to know, and I, I believe it's tax-free as well. Think about that. The fact of your own existence is the most unbelievable fact you'll ever be asked to believe. On one planet, and possibly only one planet in the entire universe, the laws of physics, which elsewhere produce nothing more interesting than bits of rock and sand and water, etc. On one planet, the laws of physics filtered through a very strange and particular process called evolution by natural selection, produced an astounding array of complex, beautiful, elegant things which carry a gigantic illusion of design. The one planet that we know has that property is this one, and maybe it can come up in the questions whether there are other such planets. But it is an astounding fact that starting from nothing more complicated than rock and sand, the process of evolution by natural selection gave rise to eventually us, with big brains capable of understanding the process that brought us into existence. What an amazing privilege that is, to be able, as physical objects, natural objects, to be able to understand our own provenance, to be able to understand why we are here, the long and gradual, extraordinary process that brought us into existence. The process of evolution by natural selection has been called a theory, it's time that we stopped calling it a theory and called it a fact. Uh, it is a fact. It's a fact as secure as any that we know in science. It is a fact that you and I are cousins of chimpanzees, slightly more distant cousins of monkeys, slightly more distant cousins, again, of shrews, uh, more distant cousins, again, of kangaroos, and more distant cousins, again, of fish, and so on. That is a fact. You will hear it described as a theory, and this is due to, um, this is fine, there is a meaning of theory according to which that's correct, but there are two meanings of theory, and in the first chapter of the book, I list two meanings from the Oxford Dictionary. One of them is theory, a hypothesis proposed as an explanation, hence a mere hypothesis, speculation, conjecture. Now that's the meaning of theory that probably immediately drops into your mind when you hear the phrase, it's only a theory. The other sense of theory from the dictionary is a scheme or system of ideas or statements held as an explanation or account of a group of facts or phenomena, a hypothesis that has been confirmed or established by observation or experiment and is propounded or accepted as accounting for the known facts, a statement of what are held to be the general laws principles or causes of something known or observed. And it's that sense of the word theory according to which it's legitimate to say that evolution is a theory. In the ordinary language use, you should, we should all describe evolution as a fact, a well-established fact. And the evidence for it is the subject of the book that I'm talking about today, The Greatest Show on Earth. I'm going to go through it chapter by chapter, speaking a little bit about each chapter, and in a few cases, reading a paragraph or two from the chapter concerned. Chapter one uh, is partly de dealing with the question of only a theory, and partly dealing with the rather disquieting fact that uh, some 40% or more of the American population do not accept this fact, and moreover, believe that the entire world, the entire universe indeed, is less than 10,000 years old. 
that is not a trivial error. Uh, I introduce the analogy of a detective coming upon the scene of a crime after it's been committed and therefore unable to be an eyewitness. That's the position we're in with evolution because most of it, almost all of it, happened before we were born and therefore, obviously, we cannot expect to be eyewitnesses of most of the process of evolution. We are detectives who come upon the scene after it's happened and like a detective in a murder story, we are presented with large numbers of clues, fingerprints, blood stains, etc. The equivalent of fingerprints, you might say, is DNA, DNA fingerprints, and very rich they are. The equivalent of footprints, you might say, are fossils. And there are all sorts of other clues which add up massively, hugely, totally convincingly to the conclusion that evolution is a fact. The second chapter, Dogs, Cows, and Cabbages, is about domestication, the domestication of cows, dogs, cabbages, turnips, um, all sorts of domestic animals and plants, um, whether for pets, whether for agriculture, whatever it is. This shows the power of selection to wreak evolutionary change. In this case, it's artificial selection. The human eye chooses which individuals shall breed, and which individuals shall not breed. And by systematically, generation after generation, choosing some for breeding and some for not breeding, we can steer evolution and steer it so comprehensively that we can change a wolf into a Pekingese or a boxer or a whippet or a St. Bernard or a poodle in a matter of centuries, mere centuries. Well, if that sort of change can be accomplished in mere centuries, just think what could be accomplished in millions of years, tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. And when you think of it like that, it's not at all surprising that we are descended from fish, we are descended from bacteria. Chapter three, the primrose path to macroevolution, is a seduction. I'm trying to take the reader by the hand and lead from artificial selection, which everybody understands, and Darwin knew that, and it was well understood before Darwin came along, to natural selection, where there is no selector, no breeder, and it was Darwin's great insight to see that you don't need a breeder, you don't need a selector. Survival will do it for you. And my primrose path takes us through gentle steps, the seduction is a gentle one. We start with peahens choosing peacocks. This is not survival of the fittest, this is reproduction of the fittest. Because peahens have certain tastes in peacocks, it follows that genes for meeting those preferences of females in peacocks are the ones that get passed on to future generations. And the result of this is the spectacular, extravagantly beautiful pl plumage of a peacock or a uh, bird of paradise. It's an eye that's doing the selection, but it's not a human eye that's doing the selection. And there's no reason to suppose that it's deliberate. It might be deliberate, but there's no reason to suppose that it is. Uh, it's enough to say that female brains, female nervous systems have certain tastes, and these tastes are reflected in the choice of which males get to breed, and that is reflected in the future evolution of the male plumage. So the first step in the primrose path is to say, yes, it's still an eye that's doing the selecting, but it's no longer a human eye. And then we go to, let's say, an anglerfish. An anglerfish is a, a, a rather squat, ugly creature which lives in the bottom of the sea. That's the female. The males are tiny little creatures which live as parasites on the female. So we're concentrating on the female who sits on the bottom of the sea and looks very camouflaged and has a fishing rod sticking out of the top of the head. It's a modified dorsal fin spine, and it, just like a fishing rod, it curls over, and on the end of it is a little wiggling bait, uh, a lure. And small fish, would be prey fish, are lured into the vicinity of the bait, and as they try to nibble at the bait on the end of the fishing rod, the anglerfish's jaws open, and there's a great inrush of water, which en and it engulfs 
the prey fish. Now, that bait and that fishing rod has been shaped by selection by the eyes of generations of prey fish. The ones that, uh, the baits that look most like wriggling worms are the ones that were most successful in luring prey fish, and that's why they were favored. It is the eyes of the prey fish that did the selecting. You would be wrong if you thought they wanted to do the selecting. They didn't want to be eaten, obviously. Um, but nevertheless, this is selection by an eye, not a human eye and not a peahen's eye, selection by an eye. Now we're ready in the seduction to go to the final step and say that any kind of survival will do the trick. The anglerfish that has the best bait, the best lure, is the one that survives because it's the least likely to starve. But anything that increases the likelihood of survival, however obscurely wrapped up inside the animal it may be, however invisible to not only our eyes but to any other creature's eyes it may be, so survival itself is all it takes to determine the non-random survival of genes that made the desirable characteristic. And so as the generations go by, the number of genes that are successful in building bodies that are good at surviving, those genes are the ones that do survive, by definition almost, almost tautologically. Those genes that are good at building bodies that survive are the ones that we see in gene pools, in species, all over the world. And that is natural selection. And it follows so beautifully, so elegantly from artificial selection, which long before Darwin, farmers, gardeners, dog breeders, pigeon fanciers, etc., understood. Nobody, or hardly anybody, before the mid-19th century made that really quite easy step. You've only got to go towards removing the human eye and substituting just plain survival, just naked survival, that will do the trick. And that is natural selection. And that is the dominant force in evolution, at least the dominant force for producing adaptive evolution, the dominant force for, for producing the overpowering illusion of design, which, as David Hume said, ravishes into admiration all who have ever contemplated it. There has to be enough time for this to happen. As I said, breeding Pekingese from wolves uh, takes a matter of centuries. And then I said, think what could be accomplished in hundreds of millions of years. Well, hundreds of millions of years is what we've got because geology tells us that, uh, that, the, that life has been around for actually about four billion, billion years, four billion years. I didn't mean to say billion twice, do you understand that? <laughs> so chapter four is called Silence and Slow Time, which is a quotation from Keats, as you all know. And it is about the way we know how old the rocks are, and therefore how old the fossils are that are in the rocks. Uh, we do it using what physicists tell us. Physicists tell us the half-life of radioactive isotopes. And igneous rock, that's rock that's formed from uh, molten lava that, is, that solidifies. At the moment when the molten lava solidifies, the clock is zeroed. And the clock is the amount of a product of a radioactive isotope's decay compared to the amount of the original isotope before it starts to decay. And if you know the half-life of the original isotope, and you then measure the amount of the product of the radioactive decay and compare it with the amount of the original isotope. It's a very simple calculation to work out when that rock first solidified. That's your radioactive clock, and that's how it is zeroed. It only works for igneous rock, doesn't work for sedimentary rock, and it's sedimentary rock that actually contains the fossils. So you have to use lumps of igneous rock as your clocks, and you date the sedimentary rock that lies underneath the igneous rock or, in the ign or around the igneous rock or in the vicinity of the igneous rock. If you've got a bit of sedimentary rock that's sandwiched between two bits of igneous rock, then you can date it approximately. You can date it to an accuracy of about 1%, which is 
Um, obviously, when you're dealing in billions of years, that's quite a lot. When you're dealing in, in only um, millions of years, it's, it's not so much. And the beauty of these ra radioactive clocks is that we have lots of them, lots of different isotopes, and they are spread over an astonishingly wide spectrum of half-lives, ranging from tens of billions of years at one end to microseconds at the other end. And because there's overlap between the time scales that these radioactive clocks can handle, you can cross-calibrate them, you can, you can uh, verify them against each other. And they all point to a coherent, self-consistent picture and it's from this that we know that the world is not 6,000 years old, but 4.6 billion years old. And we know the approximate age of any fossil that you care to discover. Chapter 5, Before Our Very Eyes. I said that uh, evolution happened before we were born, and that's uh, largely true. But there are a few examples where evolution happens so rapidly that within the lifetime of a working scientist, it's possible to see evolutionary change under conditions of natural selection on a, scale, a time scale of mere decades. And that has been done a number of times, and that's what that chapter is about. Chapter six, missing link. What do you mean, missing? This is about fossils. Uh, and um, it's a remarkable fact that, that creationists, the people who were handing you those um, tax-free, uh, I mean, origin of species, um, as you came in. Um, they love fossils because they think there are gaps in the fossil record, and they think that this is somehow detrimental to the case for evolution. Well, of course there are gaps in the fossil record. What do you expect? We're lucky to have fossils at all. If we didn't have a single fossil, the evidence for evolution as a fact would be totally secure. I shall come on to the other kinds of evidence. But actually, we do have a lot of fossils. We don't have a continuous videotape of everything that's happened in the world. <laughs> we don't have a, a movie camera. We have actually not a bad still camera, which takes flash photographs um, at irregular intervals. And obviously, what happens between those flash photographs is conjecture. But the photographs, the still photographs, which are the fossils, give us a, a reasonably complete picture. In many cases, in some groups of animals, there are no fossils at all. But no creationist wants to say that they were born yesterday. Flatworms have no fossils. Um, all, the only thing we know about flatworms is living flatworms. So uh, as far as the fossil record is concerned, they might as well have been born yesterday, but no creationist thinks that. Obviously, then they admit the existence of gaps in the fossil record. What we do not see in the fossil record, and this is the important point, we do not see a single fossil in the wrong place or the wrong time. J.B.S. Haldane said when asked what would disprove evolution, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. <laughs> not a single anachronistic fossil of that kind has ever been authentically found, and it so easily could have been. The theory of evolution is massively open to disproof. It's vulnerable to disproof, but it's never been disproved. And that is a, the sign of a good, strong theory. Chapter 7, missing persons, missing no longer. This is carrying on the theme of fossils and dealing especially with human fossils. And I'm going to read... Uh, a very short passage from the chapter on human fossils. It seems quite likely that the species we call Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy's species, you may have heard of the famous fossil from Ethiopia, Lucy, Lucy's species included our ancestors of three million years ago. Other fossils have been placed in different species of the same genus, and it's virtually certain that our ancestors were members of that genus. The first Australopithecine to be discovered, and the type specimen of the genus, the type specimen is the one that's in museums, the first to be discovered, the reference one to which dis other discoveries are compared. The type specimen of the genus was the so-called Tong child. 
At the age of three and a half, the torn child was eaten by an eagle. The evidence is that damage marks to the eye sockets of the fossil are identical to marks made by modern eagles on modern monkeys as they rip out their eyes. Poor little torn child, shrieking on the wind as you were borne aloft by the aquiline fury. You would have found no comfort in your destined fame two and a half million years on as the type specimen of Australopithecus africanus. Poor torn mother, weeping in the Pliocene. The next chapter is about embryology. Not directly evolution itself, but you can't avoid embryology because obviously what is actually evolving um, is the product of embryology. When the genes are selected, um, what we actually see in the real world is the product of an embryonic process. I'm going to read the first paragraph. That irascible genius, J.B.S. Haldane, who I've just quoted, by the way, who did so much else besides being one of the three leading architects of neo-Darwinism, was once challenged by a lady after a public lecture. It's a word-of-mouth anecdote, and John Maynard Smith is sadly not available to confirm the exact words, but this is approximately how the exchange went. Evolution skeptic. Professor Haldane, even given the billions of years that you say were available for evolution, I simply cannot believe it is possible to go from a single cell to a complicated human body, with its trillions of cells organized into bones and muscles and nerves, a heart that pumps without ceasing for decades, miles and miles of blood vessels and kidney tubules, and a brain capable of thinking and talking and feeling. J.B.S. Haldane. But, madam, you did it yourself, and it only took you nine months. The next chapter is called The Ark of the Continents, and it's about the geographical distribution of animals and plants and how that fits in precisely with what you'd expect if they had evolved. It is almost too ridiculous to mention it, but I'm afraid I have to because of the more than 40% of the American population who, as I lamented in chapter one, accept the Bible literally. Think what the geographical distribution of animals should look like if they'd all dispersed from Noah's Ark. Shouldn't there be some sort of law of decreasing species diversity as we move away from an epicenter, perhaps Mount Ararat? I don't need to tell you that that is not what we see. Why would all those marsupials, ranging from tiny pouched mice through koalas and bilbies to giant kangaroos and diprotodonts, why would all those marsupials, but no placentals at all, have migrated en masse from Mount Ararat to Australia? <laughs> Which route did they take? And why did not a single member of their straggling caravan pause on the way and settle in India, perhaps, or China, or some haven along the Great Silk Road? Why did all the penguins undertake the long waddle south <laughs> to the Antarctic, not a single one to the equally hospitable Arctic? Once again, I'm sorry to take a sledgehammer to so small and fragile a nut. <laughs> but I have to do so because more than 40% of the American people believe literally in the story of Noah's Ark. We should be able to ignore them and get on with our science, but we can't afford to because they control school boards. They homeschool their children to deprive them of access to proper science teachers. And they include many members of the United States Congress, some state governors, and even presidential and vice presidential candidates. They have the money tax-free and the power to build institutions, universities, even a museum where children ride life-size mechanical models of dinosaurs with saddles, which they are solemnly told coexisted with humans. The next chapter, chapter 10, 
is called the Tree of Cousinship. And I won't go into this in great detail, but it is, I think, the, the strongest evidence we have for the fact of evolution. If you compare living animals, you don't need any fossils, compare living animals in detail, look at the pattern of resemblance between them, and plot that pattern on a graph, what you get is a beautiful hierarchical tree. And what could that tree be but a family tree? This is shown most dramatically by facts which were unavailable to Darwin and how he would have loved them. If you do the same thing, not with gross anatomy as Darwin did, but with molecules, with DNA, where you have in every cell of every animal billions of letters of code, a four-letter code, and you can compare the individual genes from animal to animal across closely related animals and more distantly related animals, and you can literally count the number of similarities and differences. I don't just mean assess in a sort of impressionistic way, literally count the number of similarities and differences. And again, you get a beautiful hierarchical tree. And you get the same tree if you look at different genes, and the same tree if you look at gross anatomy. What could that possibly be but a family tree? We have here a pedigree. The only way to argue your way out of that is to say, well, God deliberately deceived us. Maybe he did, but I don't think that's the kind of God you want to worship. The next chapter, chapter 11, history written all over us. Once again, we don't need fossils. You look at modern animals, and what you see in really almost every part of their body is not just things that look well-designed, although much of them do look well-designed. You also see the legacies of history. History is written all over and all through an animal body. If you look at a whale or a dolphin, uh, it looks a bit like a fish and it swims like a fish and it is very agile in the water, but nevertheless, it has unmistakable relics of its ancestry on land. It breathes air with lungs. Everything about the body, if you look at it in detail, has land ancestor written all over it. In some cases, the legacy of history reveals positively bad design. I was privileged to take part for a television program in a dissection of a giraffe which had unfortunately died in a British zoo. And the reason I was so interested in, in taking part in this dissection is a particular nerve called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And this is a nerve that all mammals have. It runs from the brain to the larynx, to the voice box, it's, one of, it's a branch of one of the cranial nerves. But it doesn't go straight from the brain to the larynx. It goes down into the chest, loops its way around one of the main arteries in the chest leading from the heart, and then goes straight back up again to the larynx. In a human, that represents a detour of a few extra inches, probably no great harm done. In a giraffe, it's a detour of about 15 feet. And as we dissected this nerve coming all the way down the neck, it was remarkable to see the nerve go racing straight past the larynx, within a couple of inches of the larynx, and on down into the chest, and then turn around and come straight back up again. What kind of a designer is it who would do that? <laughs> Obviously, if it were possible to go back to the drawing board, as any designer would do, he would have had it go straight from the brain to the larynx. It becomes entirely easy to understand when you look at it through the eyes of history. In our remote fish ancestors, the equivalent of that nerve and the equivalent of the larynx were both situated posterior to the relevant artery, the equivalent of the same artery. And so in our fish ancestors, that was the most direct route for that nerve to have taken. And then, over millions of years of evolution, as the neck gradually lengthened, fish don't have a neck at all, but when ma mammals came along, and as the neck gradually lengthened, the marginal cost of each slight increase in the length of the detour 
just a millimeter at a time, increase in the length of the detour, the marginal cost of each increase was negligible compared to the enormous cost of a major embryological upheaval which would have been necessary to jump the nerve over the artery and take the more direct route. Evolution cannot go back to the drawing board. It has to improve things step by tiny step, generation by generation. And when you have to improve things generation by generation, the luxury of going to, back to the drawing board, which is available to any designer, is not available. And that's just one rather picturesque example. There are lots of other examples where the legacy of history yields imperfections which are immediately apparent to anybody who understands the principles of design. Chapter 12, Arms Races and Evolutionary Theodicy. The idea of an evolutionary arms race, I think, is an interesting and powerful one. It's an analogy with arms races between human great powers. Uh, in both cases, what you have is a, is a step by step improvement in the equipment to defeat the other side or defend against the other side. So guided missiles get better at penetrating radar, radar gets better at detecting guided missiles, and so the process escalates step by step. And the end product is that both the radars on one side and the guided missiles on the other are extremely sophisticated and, and elegant and complicated, much more than they would have needed to be if the other side hadn't been escalating at the same time. And we see the same thing in the evolution of predators versus prey, or parasites versus hosts. Whenever you see a really complicated piece of biological, quote, design, like an eye or an, a, a radar, a sonar, echolocating ear in a bat or a whale, what you're looking at is the end product of a long arms race against perhaps prey or against perhaps predators. It's arms races that gives rise to sophisticated, complex evolution. Of course, animals are also adapted to the weather. As ice ages come and go, as droughts come and go, the animals adapt. As ice ages come, they get longer, shaggier coats, and as ice ages go, the coats are shed again. Uh, and the same with droughts, the same with periods of flooding, and so on. But the weather isn't actively out to get you in the way that, say, a saber-toothed tiger is. <laughs> and if you're a saber-toothed tiger, the antelopes that you hunt are also, in a way, out to get you, because they are unreasonable enough to run away, <laughs> and thereby endanger you with starvation. And so there is, on both sides of the predator-prey arms race, an escalation. And similarly with the parasite-host arms race, on both sides there's an escalation which leads to improvement in the equipment for defeating the other side. But it doesn't actually lead to improvement in the success rate because the other side is improving at the same time. And so there's a certain element of futility about the arms race, which is the subject of the next reading that I want to give you. I lost my little tag for that one. One thing about arms races that might worry enthusiasts for intelligent design is the heavy dose of futility that loads them down. If we are going to postulate a designer of the cheetah, he has evidently put every ounce of his designing expertise into the task of perfecting a superlative killer. One look at that magnificent running machine leaves us in no doubt. The cheetah, if we're going to talk design at all, is superbly designed for killing gazelles. But the very same designer has equally evidently strained every nerve to design a gazelle that is superbly equipped to escape from those very same cheetahs. For heaven's sake, whose side is the designer on? When you look at the cheetah's taut muscles and flexing backbone, you must conclude that the designer wants the cheetah to win the race. But when you look at the sprinting, jinking, dodging gazelle, you reach exactly the opposite conclusion. 
Does the designer's left hand not know what his right hand is doing? Is he a sadist who enjoys the spectator sport and is forever upping the ante on both sides to increase the thrill of the chase? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Is it really part of the divine plan that the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the lion eat straw like the ox? In that case, what price the formidable carnassial teeth, the murderous claws of the lion and the leopard? Whence the breathtaking speed and agile escapology of the antelope and the zebra? Needless to say, no such problems arise on the evolutionary interpretation of what is going on. Each side is struggling to outwit the other because on both sides, those individuals who succeed will automatically pass on the genes that contributed to their, to their success. Ideas of futility and waste spring to our minds because we are human and capable of looking at the welfare of the whole ecosystem. Natural selection cares only for the survival and reproduction of individual genes. I'm now going to go right to the last chapter, uh, which is a sort of summary. Um, it's called, There is Grandeur in This View of Life. That sentence you will recognize as coming from the last paragraph of Darwin's On the Origin of Species. And what I've done in my last chapter is to take that last paragraph from Darwin, and I, and I have made each sentence of Darwin's last paragraph into a section heading of my last chapter. And the section itself is an exegesis of that line from Darwin. And the last sentence of Darwin's book um, begins, or ends rather, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. I'm going to now read the last page or so of my book, which takes that sentence and dissects it a little bit. Beginning with a sentence somewhat like the one with which I began this whole lecture. The fact of our own existence is almost too surprising to bear. So is the fact that we are surrounded by a rich ecosystem of animals that more or less closely resemble us, by plants that resemble us less, and on which we ultimately depend for our nourishment, and by bacteria that resemble our remoter ancestors, and to which we shall all return in decay when our time is past. Darwin was way ahead of his time in understanding the magnitude of the problem of our existence, as well as in tumbling to its solution. He was ahead of his time, too, in appreciating the mutual dependencies of animals and plants and all other creatures in relationships whose intricacy staggers the imagination. How is it that we find ourselves not merely existing, but surrounded by such complexity, such elegance, such endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful? The answer is this. It could not have been otherwise given that we are capable of noticing our existence at all and of asking questions about it. It is no accident, as cosmologists point out to us, that we see stars in our sky. There may be universes without stars in them, universes whose physical laws and constants leave the primordial hydrogen evenly spread and not concentrated into stars. But nobody is observing those universes because entities capable of observing anything cannot evolve without stars. Not only does life need at least one star to provide energy, stars are also the furnaces in which the majority of the chemical elements are forged, and you can't have life without a rich chemistry. We could go through the laws of physics one by one and say the same thing of all of them. It is no accident that we see... Dot, dot, dot. The same is true of biology. It is no accident that we see green almost wherever we look. It is no accident that we find ourselves perched on one tiny twig in the midst of a blossoming and flourishing tree of life. No accident that we are surrounded by millions of other species eating, growing, rotting, swimming, walking, flying, burrowing, stalking, chasing, fleeing, outpacing, outrunning. 
Without green plants to outnumber us at least 10 to 1, there would be no energy to power us. Without the ever-escalating arms races between predators and prey, parasites and hosts, without Darwin's war of nature, without his famine and death, there would be no nervous systems capable of seeing anything at all, let alone of appreciating and understanding it. We are surrounded by endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful. And it is no accident, but the direct consequence of evolution by non-random natural selection, the only game in town, the greatest show on earth. Thank you very much. I think this is, yes, it is on. <laughs> Professor Dawkins will now take questions. Um, I would ask you uh, when I indicate which mic we're going to be on, there are two mics down here, I believe, yes. So if you come down, just come down to the mic. I would ask you to be concise in your questions. Um, we're not looking forward to lengthy speeches. Um, I also want to tell you that we will finish at 3.30 and not later, as there is a major event on the quad at 4, and so we need to empty the auditorium and make room for them. Um, that is the blessing of the animals. And there is a certain exquisite irony in that. <laughs> and for those of you who need to rush home to get your pets, I can assure you that you will have sufficient time to do so. So if you would come down and ask questions, um, we can proceed. I would, be I would be delighted to bless your pets, only... <laughs> But I, I have a plane to catch. <laughs> Let's start right here. Could we have the house lights up? Is that possible? Yes, that would be good if we could... Yeah. Well, I don't know, actually, they may be on. Okay. This is a dim place. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Professor Dawkins, for coming. Uh, my question is, uh, I know that there are many theories about where the first cell came from that started the evolutionary process. Is there a theory or a hypothesis or concept that you favor for where the original cell? Right. Um, this, this is a big problem. It's something that we don't know the, the exact answer to. Um, long before the first cell, I suggest, we have to ask the problem of uh, where did the first self-replicating molecule come from. Once you've got a self-replicating molecule, that's a molecule that makes copies of itself accurately, high-fidelity copies, um, but with a certain small amount of inaccuracy, which is inevitable. Um, then you have the possibility of natural selection getting going, and once you've got natural selection getting going, then the whole process takes off, and that's easy. What we don't have is a clear understanding of what gave rise to the very first gene, if you like, the very first self-replicating entity. It almost certainly wasn't DNA, because DNA is a complicated self-replicating entity that requires a, a rather complicated superstructure of um, cellular machinery to copy. So we're looking for something that isn't DNA. Um, among the superstructure that it needs, do I mean superstructure or substructure? Anyway, um, um, among the machinery that DNA needed to get going would have been protein, because proteins are enzymes, and enzymes are the key to biological chemistry, and biological chemistry is the key to um, everything. And the beauty of proteins is that the one-dimensional sequence of amino acids in a protein determines the three-dimensional structure into which a protein coils itself up. And that three-dimensional structure determines its power to catalyze particular chemical reactions and no others. And that is the key to, to biology, the, key, the, the catalysis of particular chemical reactions and not others. And the, the one-dimensional array 
of amino acids in a protein is determined by DNA. We understand exactly how that's done. But DNA needs protein in order to work, and protein needs uh, DNA in order to have its sequence specified. So that is the catch-22 of the origin of life. Now, the, the theory which is currently most favored among the available theories, I would say, is probably the so-called RNA world theory. RNA, as you know, is rather like DNA, and it is a mediocre replicator, and it's a mediocre enzyme. But it's probably good enough at both replication and catalysis to have performed both functions before DNA took over the replication function and before protein took over the cat catalytic function. And so that's the theory that many people are now working on, that it started off with RNA, which was capable both of making copies of itself and of catalyzing that very process and of other biologically important processes. After that had been going on for a while, natural selection had actually got going in a rudimentary form. Natural selection then gave rise to um, perhaps the cell or perhaps at some stage then DNA took over the replication function, protein took over the, um, the, 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 the catalytic function, and then we're away. But it is a very difficult problem, and there is no clearly defined answer at present. Uh, Professor, uh, we've always uh, been told not to procreate with our, with our uh, close relatives because of a lack of variety in the gene pool. So if you had a modern species that is endangered and you bring the situation all the way down to a few couples, or if you bring the argument to uh, Adam and Eve couple, just a single reproducing a reproductive couple, would you have enough mutation, enough naturally occurring variation and mutation from those few couples to bring the population back up to a healthy population? Yes, yes this was, of course, the problem that faced um, the progeny of Adam and Eve. Um, <laughs> um, the, pr the, the biggest problem with um, incestuous mating is that it brings to the fore lethal recessives. Um, we all of us contain uh, a few lethal recessive genes, um, but it doesn't matter because lethal recessive genes, as you know, have to be paired off with their identical opposite number before they show their lethal effects. And they are rare for obvious reasons, natural selection selects against them, so they're rare in the population as a whole. So when you choose a random member of the opposite sex to mate with, the chance that your lethal recessives will happen to coincide with his or hers uh, will, uh, is, is, is low. It occasionally happens, and it's very unfortunate when it does. But if you mate with your sister, then the chance is very high that your lethal recessives will match hers, and therefore uh, you will produce um, deformed or dead uh, offspring. Um, oddly enough, I mean, it's not that odd, um, if you carry on with brother-sister matings for enough generations, like populations of white rats in laboratories, you get rid of all the lethal recessives at a cost of a lot of death, but once they've all been selected out, then you end up with a pure strain which are pretty much identical twins of each other. Uh, and then the lethal recessives have all gone, natural selection has removed them, and so populations of laboratory white rats breed perfectly well with brother-sister mating uh, for, that, for that reason. The questioner asks whether if, a, if there was a bottleneck in a particular species, as there was among, among cheetahs not that long ago, and as there actually probably was among humans between 70,000 and 90,000 uh, years ago, we seem to have gone through a bottleneck of, of only a few hundred people. Um, then is there enough variation to avoid the lethal recessive problem? Well, evidently in some cases there is, because here we are, we did survive that, that catastrophe. I mean, it is a, it is a big problem, but it's not, a, it's not a total wipeout, and it ev evidently wasn't. In, in that case. Uh, hello. I was watching a lecture you gave in 1991 about climbing Mount Improbable. You had said that you didn't like the idea that insects and birds were evolving simultaneously and pushing each other up Mount Improbable, but you didn't explain why. I was wondering why that was. Gosh. Um, <laughs> I, I have forgotten the reference. Um, I can't, I'm sorry to say, I can't quite imagine what I might have been meaning by that, and I'm sorry that um, it seems to have stuck in your mind. Um, it, it, I, don't, I don't mean to make people laugh, I'm sorry. Um, I, 
I mean, cl Climbing Mount Improbable, I, I've written a book called Climbing Mount Improbable, which grew out of those lectures in 1991 that you, you saw. Um, the idea is that um, Mount Improbable is a mountain that has a great sheer cliff on one side and a shallow, gentle slope the other side. And perched on the top of the mountain is a very complicated thing like an eye, which, as many people have realized, couldn't possibly come about by sheer luck, by sheer chance. For that to happen would be equivalent to leaping, to a mountaineer leaping from the bottom of the mountain right up the sheer cliff to the top in one bound. It cannot happen. But it's easier to get to the top of the mountain if you go around the other side and climb up the gentle slope step by tiny step. And that's what evolution does. So it's easy to get from no eye to a beautifully functioning human eye or eagle eye, um, provided you do it in small steps, and that's exactly what happens. So Mount Improbable is a metaphor for that. But the questioner asks about insects and birds going together up the... Uh, you said... You said that you didn't like the idea that they were evolving simultaneously and pushing each other up Mount Improbable. Like the insect would uh, go to a camel, uh, develop a better camouflage, the bird would develop better eyes to see that camouflage, and it was just like a back and forth. You had said that you didn't like that idea, and um, you didn't explain, so I was wondering why. I, I'm sorry, I, I think that there must be a misunderstanding. I must have, I must have misspoken, and, and, and I think you misunderstood what I was saying, because it doesn't, I'm sorry to say it doesn't ring any bells, but I've, 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 expounded the, the metaphor of Mount Improbable anyway, and um, it's one of the books that I'm, of mine that I'm most pleased with, and it's one of the least read books, so. <laughs> so let, I, let me give uh, Professor Dawkins a dispensation. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hi, Professor. Um, I'm wondering where you get your inspiration from, because throughout history, when people, you know, and bravery, uh, throughout history, people who speak out against intelligent design and uh, are a blasphemist. Uh, these pe these people are your friends who will exile you. You know, uh, uh, people who are m my friends and family. Even if uh, I stand there and watch them teaching my little cousins uh, a bunch of crap, frankly, <laughs> uh, and there's not much I can do about it without uh, uh, discrediting me or in some way. And you know. Uh, in the future, potentially seek, seeking political office, expressing my views practically uh, uh, makes me incapable of achieving that. So I'm wondering, I mean, you pro uh, it's a lifestyle change. Uh, I don't, you probably didn't intend it, but uh, you probably have to have security with you all the time. And I'm No, I do not. I mean, I'm yeah. delighted that these gentlemen here are... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can see they're well cast for the role. Um, <laughs> But um, uh, I, I, I don't feel threatened, and um, I, I guess it, I, it's easy enough for me. I fly in, give a lecture, and fly out. Um, you're talking about um, your uh, very laudable and, and plausible ambition to become president of the United States, and, and um, um, uh, the, the fact that it would be, be difficult to do so in the present climate of opinion. I don't, I mean, I, I would encourage you to talk to your young cousins and talk sense to them, um, because it's child abuse in a way to, to deprive children of the, um, of, of the sheer wonder of the truth, which is the, 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 the truth of the history of how they come to be in, in existence, and that is tragic. Um, as for being unable to do that because of alienating yourself from your community and future political office, that is tragic and scandalous. And um, I can only hope that if enough people like you stand up and uh, gather together, band together with other people like those who just stood up in this audience um, and change the climate of opinion in this country, uh, you know that the idea of a tipping point the idea of a sort of critical mass, that once a sufficient number of people um, stand up and be counted, uh, once it becomes realized that the, the non-religious community in this country, as polls demonstrate, is as large as any single religious denomination. But you would never know that because such people don't speak out. They don't have the, 
the loud and strident and truculent voice that the, uh, many of the religious people do. So um, enough, if enough people like you stand up and join your voices together, you will easily reach the tipping point when um, America will suddenly realize, gosh, we're not a country of, that's entirely made up of religious people at all. We thought we were, but we got it wrong. And uh, I can only encourage you to join with others. I think you saw the list of um, local free thought organizations up there. Join them and, and get things changed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming so much, um, Professor Dawkins. I, real quickly, I'll be very brief. Uh, how best to deal with uh, people every day in my conversations as a graduate student and in my life in general, when talking about the theory of evolution, uh, the fact, as I should say. Uh, you answered it earlier in your lecture, and you'll probably say the same thing, which is fine, but not, it's bad enough that the religious people dismiss us or me or whatever. Uh, but how best to deal with classmates and colleagues and educated people who say, it's only a theory. And when I try to say, as you say, they just dismiss it out of hand as it's just a theory. How best to deal with that, in your opinion? God, I mean, uh, well, for a start, um, tell them it's not a theory, it's a fact. I mean, it would be nice if they were sufficiently philosophically sophisticated to understand that the word theory can mean different things. But um, given the situation as it is, you're probably better off saying, no, it's not a theory, uh, it's a fact. Um, it's as much a fact as the fact that the Earth orbits the sun. Or, if you don't want to call that a fact, if you want to call that a theory, I mean, that is a theory in the technical philosophical sense. Um, it is only a theory that the Earth orbits the sun. It's a theory that will never be falsified. Uh, and um, maybe you could try that, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> um, or tell them to go and buy Jerry Coyne's book, or mine. Hello, Professor. Um, I have a question about education. As a first-year high school biology teacher, I am teaching in a community where evolution is not well-received. And it's something that I studied in college and graduate school, and I feel really strongly about. So if you had to boil it down to maybe a couple, one or two main points that I should focus on my first year, kind of communicating this to the students, because Oddly enough, when I teach this, I found in my student teaching that even though the students are resistant, um, it's actually the stuff they're most curious about and they have the most questions about because it's our own history. And when we talk about that, they have a lot of really good questions, but then they're still very resistant. So if you could just comment on that, that would be great. I mean, you're asking me once again to, to give advice on how to actually conduct affairs in, 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 in the situation that you're in. It reminds me, I mean, the opening paragraph of The Greatest Show on Earth um, compares the plight of a biology teacher such as yourself with, with a Latin teacher, a teacher of classical languages, who, unable to get on with the job of teaching Latin and Greek um, and classics generally, has to confront a sort of rearguard action from pupils and their parents who deny that the Romans ever existed. So how can you learn Latin if you think the Romans never existed? I mean, evolution is the central theorem of biology. You cannot even begin to understand biology without evolution. It's a nonsense to try to get anywhere on any branch of biology whatsoever unless you do it in terms of evolution. So I think you've just got to do your job and teach teach it, and if that makes if people want to argue with you, argue back. You've got all the arguments on your side. They've got none, not a single one. Um, <laughs> the only thing they could bring to the table would be, well, my parents told me that this was the case, or my preacher told me this was the case. Well, damn your preacher. <laughs> These are the facts, and my advice would be, contrary to most of my colleagues, don't treat them with respect. Um, 
Or rather, I qualify that in the words of the British journalist Johan Hari, I respect you as a person too much to respect your ridiculous beliefs. <laughs> So, despite the fact that I'm a Yankee fan, I'm now going to call on this Tampa Bay fan over here. We should have a Red Sox fan. Um, professor, uh, I'm a chemist in graduate school here, and I've noticed that a lot of my colleagues kind of maintain their creationist attitudes and beliefs, uh, largely, it seems, based on their upbringing. And, you know, as the people that seem most well equipped to understand and to use objectivity and rationality to get beyond this. Um, I was wondering how you feel that impacts the power of education to help people overcome, you know, these yeah, isn't that the, Isn't that the same question? I, I, yeah, I, um, it's um, similar. I'm not sure what more I can say. I, um, I, guess, I guess, do you find it disheartening that that happens, or alarming, or how do you... Well, I do find it disheartening, but, but that, that's a, a stimulus to try to do something about it, and, and one, one shouldn't retreat and, and, and run away because, it, because it's difficult. Um, I think you should hit them with the evidence, and, and um, the, the evidence is massive, overwhelming, undeniable, if, you, if they'll only look at it. I guess my point being that they have been hit by the evidence over and over and over again. I doubt it. Um, <laughs> take them to the museum and, and show them some fossils. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Hi, Professor. Um, I'm a PhD candidate here in uh, theoretical physics. I'm also a very active member of the Duke Secular Alliance. As we all know, there's a few hundred feet from here, there's a world-famous Duke Chapel. And a little bit further away, there is the Duke Divinity School. My question to you is that, in your personal opinion, do these departments or institutions have any uh, value in higher education, or do what they do have any virtue in a larger context of higher learning or higher education? Well, if, Thank if you. If you look at what goes on in a divinity school, uh, you will find that there are very reputable scholars um, doing a biblical history, um, uh, the bi biblical literature, looking at comparing translations of various books of the Bible. I mean, many books of the Bible are beautiful works of literature and deserve uh, literary study. Um, the Christian and Jewish religions have had enormous influence on world history, and so you cannot understand history unless you understand something about them. You can't understand literature, English literature, unless you are pretty well steeped in the Bible, because there are so many references and so many allusions to uh, biblical passages. So it, th there certainly is, is an awful lot of worthwhile stuff going on in departments of divinity in, in universities. Um, as for the chapel, um, perhaps there's some nice music. Um, <laughs> uh, and there's very beautiful stained glass. Um, and. Uh, some people find it valuable to sit in quiet and contemplate. Um, I don't think there's any value in full-blooded theology, in, in academics writing learned articles on the exact meaning of the transubstantiation and whether, the, whether Jesus really does turn himself into a wafer or not, um, <laughs> or whether it's only symbolic. Um, it seems to me that that activity as, actually, as Thomas Jefferson said of his University of Virginia, that has no place in our university. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you uh, first for coming and spreading the lies of Lucifer on this university today. <laughs> Just kidding. Trying to make you feel at home in the Bible Belt. <laughs> My question refers, or is about the relationship between host and parasite, and now I'm talking about the relationship between the United States and Israel, the unconditional support uh, economically, militarily, and politically that we give them, uh, the existence of APEC in this country, the condition of the, the um, reset, resettling in Palestine. What do you see as the future of what is going to happen in that country? Because since 1947, it's been nothing but headstrong battles. I, I've learned from bitter experience that if I say anything about Israel, um, I get more hate mail than for any other cause. Um, 
And um, I, as I say, I, I have learned from experience. I'm going to say very, very little. Um, I think all, all, all I would say is that on, on either side of this terrible and unfortunate uh, dispute, the one thing that really worries me is when people on either side will justify their position because they say that they have a title to the land that goes back two or 3,000 years. Um, you cannot justify uh, modern political stands by appealing to uh, ancient scriptures, um, which were written in totally different times. And uh, it, it seems to me to be a, a one of the many wicked consequences of religion. This shows itself both in Islam and Judaism, that people will, will justify what they do on scriptural uh, grounds. But beyond that, I'm going to say nothing about the politics of the Middle East. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. First of all, Mr. Hitchens, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for asking each of us, albeit indirectly, uh, for us to run for our respective school boards. Is, is Mr. Hitchens here? I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, I was, <laughs> Mr. Goggins, I'm okay, sorry. Right, okay. That involves this, the, my question. I mean, I wish he was here. But, but, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, my wife and I just recently watched Chris, uh, the debate between Christopher Hitchens and a mathematician uh, down in Alabama on C-SPAN recently. And it brought to mind uh, the question of, and I like your, your thoughts on it, how you know, the 40% of Americans aside, those who apparently have been trained in scientific thought, theory, uh, the, the logic, have seen the evidence of evolution and yet still cling to some notion that some supernatural force has to be behind all this. I'd like to know your thoughts on how, how, do, how can you explain such a disconnect with... Well, okay, I mean, the, the disconnect is, is not so great in those cases where um, the religious, the, the scientists you're talking about um, have what you could call Einsteinian religion, which means that they, they, like Einstein, sometimes use the word God, but don't actually, they don't actually believe in a personal God. They're using the word God in a, a sort of metaphorical sense to kind of personify in a picturesque way that which we don't yet understand about the laws of physics and so on. So setting them on one side, because they're really no different from, from any of us. Um, there are those people who are sort of religious and may even call themselves Christian, but believe in an old earth, don't believe that God had any hand in evolution, etc., which would be true of most bishops. I mean, they would, they would say they believe in evolution, they think that perhaps God had a hand in starting the universe off, um, and then they go into something about Jesus, which has nothing to do with, um, <laughs> with, with anything much. Um, and then you've got some, some scientists, like, like uh, Francis Collins, head of the National Institutes of Health, who, who is a real Christian, actually does believe that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. And um, I don't know whether he believes that Jesus turned water into wine and things like that. I doubt it. But he probably does believe in the resurrection. Um, they're pretty rare, actually. I mean, that, that, that t type of top scientist is pretty rare. And then there are some who, uh, who believe the world is young, believe the world is less than 10,000 years old, even though they've been exposed to the evidence. They're the ones that I really can't get to grips with. There's, there's Kurt Wise, I forget where he is, I don't think he's here, um, who was trained in geology at Chicago, PhD at Harvard in geology, knows his geology inside out, and yet is a young earth creationist. And he has said, if all the evidence in the universe pointed to an old earth, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be, I still believe in a young earth, because that is what Holy Scripture tells me. Now, there is a man who knows the evidence, he is a scientist, he can appreciate the scientific evidence, and he says, if push comes to shove, and there's a contradiction between the evidence and Scripture, then I go with Scripture. When he knows perfectly well where Scripture comes from, it's a, it's a set of scrolls which were written by various groups of tribesmen of, of desert-dwelling goat herds, um, absolutely no reason to take the 
the Jewish scripture as anything any more authentic than the scripture of Australian Aboriginals, the, 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 the word of mouth law of Australian Aboriginals or North American Indians or South Ameri Na Native South Americans or African tribes. Um, this seems to me to be uh, a, a form of something close to insanity. And I don't know how I can deal with, with, with that. Uh, but I, I think once again, people who have actually taken on board the evidence and understood it and yet think the earth is young, I suspect they're pretty rare as well. All right, this will have to be the last question. Okay. Thank you. Um, my question has to do with what you presented us today, and, and I have to say that most of it is stuff I got in my 10th grade biology class in South Carolina, no less. Uh, and so there is some good biology being taught out there. Absolutely to, sure there is, yeah. had to dissect a pig. I didn't get a giraffe's neck. Uh, so you've had some advantages maybe that I didn't have. But, but I want to say we all have a belief system. Yours is science. Mine happens to be Trinitarian theology. And I wonder if we have something we can offer each other that would be mutually beneficial to fight some of the things that your foundation has outlined as necessary to be opposed to. I, for one, and I think many, many people who go into Duke Chapel to do more than look at the windows and listen to the music, would be on your side for alleviating suffering, for opposing those things in the world that disallow the flourishing of humanity. <clears throat> you bring up LGBT concerns. Many of my colleagues and friends do as well. Why the polemics? Why the necessity to ridicule people of faith when indeed the people of faith might link arms with you and work together to stamp out some of the stupidity and the ignorance that you say you Yes, yeah, I have not the slightest doubt that, that uh, people of your persuasion are, are extremely good people who do good things um, in, the, in the world. There's no problem about that, and we agree totally about that. Um, what, where we don't agree is about truth. It's about what actually is true about the universe. And um, I I'm, don't wish to be polemical. I'm very happy to have a, a proper discussion, a proper argument with you, and to ask you to justify your Trinitarian beliefs. And we would have a, an interesting, unfortunately there's no time at the moment, but um, you, we would have a very interesting discussion about that. So I, I don't think that that impinges really upon um, the, the fact that we, we are both trying to do good in the world. We're all trying to do good in the, in the world. Um, so let's go on trying to do good in the world, but let's not confuse the fact that you do good in the world with, um, with um, the, 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 the idea that what, what you believe about the world and the universe and the Trinity is therefore true. It's a separate question. We need to look at the evidence. I don't believe there is any, and that's what I would argue about if we had time. Um, but yes, let's, let's be friends by all means. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.